Good afternoon. I'm Mackenzie Glenn Zadrali, Senior Enrichment Program Director with the Wisconsin Alumni Association. On behalf of our organization and our program partner, the Wisconsin Union, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to our Wisconsin Idea Spotlight, the Fight for Free Speech Program. Though we are unable to gather in person due to COVID-19, we are thrilled to bring Badgers together for this virtual event. Before we begin, a few notes. First, please acknowledge with me that the Wisconsin Alumni Association and UW-Madison are situated upon traditional territories. The Wisconsin Alumni Association respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. During our program today, we welcome your comments and questions. Please use the chat feature on YouTube to ask your questions and we will do our best to answer them during the question and answer session. And now I'd like to welcome our distinguished speakers. Ian Rosenberg is the author of The Fight for Free Speech, 10 Cases That Define Our First Amendment Freedoms, published in February of this year. Since 2003, he has provided ABC News clients with pre-broadcast counsel on news gathering, libel, intellectual property, and FCC regulatory issues. In addition, Rosenberg teaches media law at Brooklyn College. He started his legal career in a, as a clerk in the Eastern District of New York and as a litigation associate at Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell. He is also an Emmy-nominated documentary filmmaker. Rosenberg graduated with distinction from the UW and magna cum laude from, the Cornell, from Cornell Law School. During his time at UW, Rosenberg was also the Wisconsin Union President from 1993 to 94. Welcome, Ian. Thanks for having me, Mackenzie. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Donald Downs is the director and co-founder of the UW Wisconsin Center for the Study of Liberal Democracy, which is dedicated to instilling critical knowledge and understanding of liberal democracy's core principles institutions and processes to the advancement of intellectual diversity on campus. Downs also served as the director of UW's Legal Studies Program and its Center for the Study of Law, Society and Justice. He was the president and former secretary of the Committee for Academic Freedom and Rights, a leading independent nonpartisan faculty group. Since retiring, Down has been the lead faculty advisor to the Free Speech and Open Inquiry Project of the Institute for Humane Studies in Washington, D.C. An author, Downs has earned numerous honors and awards for his work and teaching. He is most recently the author of Free Speech and Liberal Education. Welcome, Don. Well, thank you, Mackenzie. Very happy to be here. Great to have you. And finally, our moderator for today's program is Kathleen Brown. Culver. Culver is the James E. Burgess Chair in Journalism Ethics, an Associate Professor in the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and Director of the Center for Journalism Ethics. She also serves as Visiting Faculty for the Pointer Institute for Media Studies and was the Founding Editor of PBS Media Shifts Education Section. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. I'm really delighted to be here. We are thrilled to have all of you with us today. Katie, may I turn it over to you? Absolutely, I'm very excited to get going. Don and I have known each other for about 30 years. I'm a, a student and friend, and uh, Ian and I are more recent friends as I have just bought and read his fantastic book and begun assigning it to my students. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me turn to um, the discussion between Ian and Don. Just to note for everybody, um, we're gonna have this discussion and then turn to your questions. So please feel free to um, put them into the comments and we'll round them up and do our best to get to as many as we can. But my first burning question for the two of you is, how do you know each other? Well, I'll answer that one. I'll start answering that one. Um, so I, I was a theater major at the University of Wisconsin, and I was just always interested in, in constitutional law. So I, I took uh, Professor Downs' uh, constitutional law class on a lark, uh, was enjoying it enormously. And then I remember one fateful day uh, being at the, uh, at the Rathskeller uh, waiting in line at the cafeteria and seeing him and like I had read some article about free speech which I used as an excuse to like 
go up to him and like chat with him about it. And we said something, I don't remember what the topic was, but we, we chatted about it for a minute. And then I we sort of both made our way through uh, the line. And at the end, uh, I was like walking away, Professor Downs uh, said, uh, do you, do you want to sit and, and keep talking about this? And I remember being thrilled that I would have the opportunity uh, to just chat and engage with him uh, outside of the big lecture class. Uh, and that meeting and, and um, Professor Downs uh, becoming a mentor to me, um, which is why I will often slip into calling him Downs, by the way. Um, Downs becoming a mentor uh, to me really changed my life. I not only ended up going to law school, but I met a good friend in the class I made a good friend in the class um, named Stephanie Lasko, and uh, she ended up introducing me to my wife. So all good things um, come out of uh, who happened to be her sister. Um, so all good things come uh, out of uh, my connection with Don. Well, let me say that it's a, it's a two-way street. Uh, in my book, I talk about how the university is an intellectual polis, by which I mean it's a place where discussion about what goes on in class and goes on in the world uh, should take place everywhere, not just in the classroom, but outside the classroom, in the dorms, uh, on State Street, you know, you name it. Yeah. And so uh, being engaged with students like Ian and students who might be watching uh, the alumni out there, uh, having known you and worked with you and engaged with you uh, was certainly a highlight, not only of my career, but of my life. And so I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, I was, I didn't go to Wisconsin but as I was telling the people involved in this program, uh, that I always felt like an alumnus by association. My wife went here, uh, her parents went here, her brother went here, uh, half my high school class virtually went here, and I would always come back to Madison during college days and you know have a good time. I can't say everything I did. The statute of limitations hasn't worn out always on all of them, perhaps, but uh, it was always a great time. And uh, so the university always meant very much to me, and this was my dream job. And students like Ian helped make it that. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Mackenzie and all the staff and the UW Foundation uh, and the Alumni Association uh, for putting this together. Yes, thank you. Notice the union. Team. Now, the union was ahead of the union. And I was, if the union was part of my life here, I practically lived there sometimes. So I want to thank them as well. Yes. Shout out to the Wisconsin Union, indeed. Absolutely. Okay, so first question. Yeah. Okay, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when it's always an interesting question and often a rather existential question. Uh, why someone decides in the first place to write a book yeah. and then uh, why that particular book? And uh, so that's my first question for you, Ian. How, why did you... Why did you want to write a book at all? I mean, you're a busy guy. <laughs> and why this particular book? Well, yeah, well, so the idea for this book started about three years ago, and it really started around the, the dining room table. Uh, as Mackenzie said, I'm an in-house counsel for ABC News, and I work with Nightline as one of the main shows that I do the legal review for. And that night, I was uh, reviewing a piece about the tragedy at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School uh, and the student activism that had come out of that. And I was talking about it with my kids who were ages 12 and 10 at the time. Uh, and they both became interested in um, talking about participating in the national school walkout, which was about to happen, and wanted to know what would happen to them if they did engage in the protest and what their free speech rights were. And, and I realized that Americans of all ages around that time and over the last four years have really been confronted with a barrage of free speech and free press questions, and that there hasn't been a general interest guide uh, written really in more than a decade. So I wrote the fight for free speech to be a user's guide uh, to understanding our free speech rights today. And it's um, the structure of the book is that each chapter begins with a contemporary question from national school walkout to can Colin Kaepernick take an, uh, a knee and what does uh, the NFL, uh, what can they do to him uh, to uh, can Trump stop Stormy Daniels from appearing on 60 Minutes. So I start each chapter with those burning questions and then I tell the story of people who fought for their free speech rights that led all the way to a Supreme Court decision that answers that question. And I see this book as a, a crash course in learning about um, your First Amendment rights, but also these fascinating stories uh, of people who fought 
for their rights. Um, usually, you know, individuals, not big corporations, but people all over this country who had a burning desire to speak and be heard. Right, and often at, at great at great odds against them. And that's that's right, great, yeah. against great odds, and and who suffered um, really, you know, a, a lot of consequences for their speech. One of the themes that's of the right. book is that um, freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from responsibility. But I, I'm sure we'll we'll get into that more. Right. Later. Well, I have this little sign behind me that's from Berkeley, in the free speech movement, that says, "You know, speech is free, talk or speech is free, but free speech is not." So it's an enterprise that has to be. Uh, Worked on very hard. Uh, I should mention very, you know, very strongly. <clears throat> I reread your book again yesterday, <clears throat> and usually when you read a book a second time, uh, you sadly realize why your original enthusiasm was misbegotten. <laughs> and in your case, quite the opposite occurred. I mean, I realized even more. This is really all the fans out there. <laughs> this is a really well written book. The title's perfect because the fight for free speech. It is a fight. Free speech is always under attack by whatever kind of reigning orthodoxy happens to exist during the day. Uh, it could be nationwide. It could be institutional. It could be uh, in a certain town, whatever. There are different kinds of orthodoxies. And it's a fight that can be won and it can be lost. And so we have to be constantly aware about it. And Ian's book really makes us aware of that. And, you know, I've been teaching this stuff for 30 some years. And, or I was teaching this stuff for 30 minutes some years, I'm emeritus now. And I learned things I didn't know before. Oh, thank you. Uh, the well, book is a wonderful primer just in legal process. Thank you. And you, know, you were always such a, a great teacher and so um, uh, had such an amazing ability to uh, convey these you know, constitutional questions in terms that undergraduates could understand. And, you know, most of my career has been devoted to explaining complicated free speech and free press concepts to smart people who aren't lawyers, to journalists at ABC News, correspondents, producers, anchors. Um, I teach a media law class at Brooklyn College to communication art students, to my kids. And I, I really realize that you can ditch jargon and academic theory, um, that wisdom can be condensed, as historian Timothy Snyder says, <laughs> Um, but it doesn't need to be dumbed down. And right, so right. I, I try to you, tell these stories in a, in a conversation. You really struck the right way. note there, I think, because it, it, it is kind of an introductory text, but it's not dumbed down. And I, you know, I have a hard, my books are, tend to be a little thicker, you know, more quote unquote scholarly. And I do my best to, to have clear language, but it's a very difficult thing to pull off. This is your first book. Uh, and yeah. that's, that's a remarkable kind of uh, a, a thing to, to pull off. Thank you. Uh, what kind of feedback have you gotten so far on the book? Well, what kind well of the feedback has been really great. And I think, um, you know, I, I think it speaks to what you were saying before about where does this fight sort of continue. And, you know, what I hope people get out of this book is that even though I use Supreme Court cases, 10 key Supreme Court cases to give an overview of our free speech rights starting in 1919 uh, and going all the way to 2017, the Supreme Court cases are, um, Supreme Court resolution of free speech fights are few and far between, as you were alluding to, that, that people really engage with free speech issues every day on the ground, right. in their schools, in their classrooms, and in community centers, at synagogues and mosques and churches, at, at town councils. And I want this book uh, to be um, a guide for people to sort of arm themselves with the knowledge they need to be able to fight for free speech every day as a grassroots activity. Um, yeah. Most of the time we won't, uh, very few of us will ever reach the Supreme Court, but I think that the feedback has been so strong because people are looking to engage with these issues um, in an informed way. Right, and it's so important these days because <clears throat> recent work has shown that civic and constitutional knowledge in our country is sadly lacking. Yeah especially as among young people. And so uh, as a free speech activist, both on campus and in the nation, uh, I've always said the very first step, and I stress this in my, in my book as well, the very first step we have to take is to disseminate knowledge. So people can frame and look at free speech questions from the perspective of having been informed so they can make more intelligent and informed judgments regardless of what they eventually conclude. Absolutely. And I don't want the conversation uh, uh, people to feel that the conversation ends with these Supreme Court decisions, both because the Supreme Court evolves 
um, their decisions over time, but also because that's not the end of the conversation. Right. Just because the Supreme Court has said something doesn't mean that we have to agree with it. We can advocate for change in, in lots right. of other ways, but we do need to know what the rights and limits are right. uh, as established by the court before we can even bring about change. So we can make informed judgments. Yeah. Right. And uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned in your book, you stress in your book, uh, modern free speech doctrine is there for a reason, and it came out of a dissent. And that's Justice Holmes, supported often by Justice Brandeis. Yes, they were unlikely friends. And, you know, <laughs> I, the first chapter of my book begins with uh, the Women's March on, um, on Washington in 2017, right. and Madonna uh, talking about how she has thought a lot about blowing up the White House. Uh, when I wrote that three years ago, I had no idea that Trump's uh, defense team would use that um, as an example um, of why they claimed he was protected by free speech. But I, I talk about advocacy of illegal action um, and the, the limits of that advocacy. And as you say, uh, Justice Holmes introduces uh, the, the concept of the marketplace of ideas um, in the, the response to the, the key case I discussed um, there, which is uh, the Abrams case involving an immigrant um, young you. woman named Molly Steimer who comes to this country at 16, um, becomes radicalized by the hard life that she lives on the Lower East Side as a garment worker. I'm on the Lower East Side right now, blocks from where <laughs> she threw anti-war leaflets out uh, condemning World War One, And the court upheld her conviction, uh, the Supreme Court upholds her conviction uh, under the Espionage Act um, for speaking out against the government, but Justice Holmes um, talks about in dissent, the marketplace of ideas and, and that theme um, that the best test of truth is the power for it to get accepted in the marketplace um, is, you know, the undergirding of all of our free speech law today. I also raise the real problems with the marketplace of ideas. As, um, as many uh, critical race theorists and equity theorists have pointed out, you know, who gets access to the market? Um, you know, women and, and uh, black people um, have traditionally been excluded from the market. And that's one of the real problems with, uh, with the marketplace concept. But again, you need to know about um, this metaphor in order to approach free speech. Right. And so, you know, the marketplace has opened its doors. Every successful movement in American history, including the social justice movements, have ridden the back of free speech. You know, Jonathan Rauch has written a lot about this when it comes to gay rights. Uh, the gay movement, of course, of course, the obvious examples of you know, the women's movement, uh, the, so, the um, civil rights movement, uh, to be sure. Uh, the night before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King uh, gave a speech in Atlanta in which he, he spoke against the injunction that had been issued against his uh, speaking. And he said that in America, everyone's entitled to a free speech right. Yes. And this is very important to our movement. So he was a champion of the First Amendment. And more, your book, I think, shows us how social justice and free speech need to go together. Well, well I absolutely yeah. believe that, yes. And, and I do also talk about Dr. King. You're right, you know, he, he in that famous speech, he said, somewhere I've heard about the freedom of speech. Yeah, um, and, uh, and I talk about Dr. King's other free, uh, one of his other um, free speech battles um, that leads to our modern uh, un uh, understanding of libel law. Um, you know, when Trump and, and Justice Thomas uh, said that we should change libel laws and that the media can lie and get away with it, um, that's not true. The media can't lie and get away with it. That's not our libel standard. And, and the case that I tell the story of that explains that is civil rights defendants, uh, uh, civil rights activists, uh, including Dr. King, who were uh, had an ad taken out to in the New York Times to support them. Uh, the New York Times and the uh, Minister defendants were sued for libel by Southern uh, officials. Um, it goes up to the Supreme Court and Justice Brennan, Brennan creates our new, uh, then new and, and uh, current today actual malice standard, um, which says that the media can make small mistakes uh, and, um, and be excused for criticizing public officials if right. there's are small mistakes, but they can't turn a blind eye to the right. truth um, and they can't um, engage in knowing falsehood. So Dr. King and the civil rights movement are really at the heart of our modern libel uh, right. protections. Very much so. And before we move on to the next question, let me just, uh, we're talking about Holmes and one of Holmes' great lines in, a, in another free speech case is that freedom of speech, uh, which he considers our most important right, means nothing if it doesn't include tolerance, at least legal tolerance, and some and for the speech that we hate. Yeah. Because you don't need free speech protection if what you're saying is agreeable to everybody. 
And people forget how you know the civil rights movement was so opposed by many people, especially in the South, but also elsewhere. And there was a lot of hate involved in that suppression and anger claims that you know, Martin Luther King himself was fomenting hate in a, in a different kind of way. At least that was the claim. Right. And so by fighting against that, uh, he was able to establish uh, the things that he did, which are obviously very important. So that's a, a lesson we have to keep in mind as well. Yes. Well, anyway, so you know, the book, I think, is really good at getting at the, all these points and, and questions. Uh, the next question is, how fundamental is the f freedom of speech to representative democracy? Or as I say in my book, liberal democracy. Right. Well, I, I think it's, it's you know, uh, it's absolutely fundamental. The free speech and our free press rights are absolutely fundamental um, to maintaining our democracy. I, you know, I think if the last just last year has shown us everything, uh, anything, it's that um, we need to have um, uh, a robust um, uh, protections for dissent and robust protections for the press be it um, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement after the tragic death uh, and murder of George Floyd, um, or you know, um, the press speaking out about um, you know, false allegations that there was uh, election fraud, um, to you know, honest and accurate reporting about uh, the COVID crisis. Um, we need to really, I don't think it's overstating to say that we need to protect the press and, um, and dissenters uh, in order for our democracy to survive and, and perhaps for us just to even survive as a society. You know, President Biden says um, that democracy is fragile, and I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, and it echoes uh, a statement that I talk about at the beginning of my book that Justice Souter was fond of telling a story uh, that Ben Franklin was apparently asked after the Constitutional Convention um, people on the street asked him, what kind of uh, government will our new nation have? Uh, and he said, a republic if we can keep it. Um, and Justice Souter liked to add, and you can't keep it in ignorance. So I think um, that we you know, have not been able, um, most people have not been able to really um, learn about their free speech and free press rights. Um, and that if we don't learn about those rights, our democracy is really threatened. So the fight for free speech is hopefully a tool to help shore up democracy in that way. Right, right. And, and, the, and the free speech must apply everywhere. I mean, the press hasn't gotten every issue right. You know, the, fresh, the press is not immune to criticism itself. It's a question of what kind of criticism and what you do with that criticism. Uh, because classic First Amendment theory is that no person, no institution, no government is in the absolute possession of the truth, has monopoly on the truth. So as the press questions certain attitudes toward COVID and certain policies, we also know that the press has sometimes been wrong about that too. And that no expert has gotten this question perfectly right either. Uh, it's a very complicated kind of question, like a lot of our policy issues. Uh, nor should any group that uh, becomes persuasive by writing the back of free speech be immune to criticism itself because we're all flawed. No one has total truth, you know, at least after the fall in the Garden of Eden or whatever. And uh, so I think what, I, what concerns me a lot now is uh, that some criticism, some to claim that something is misinformation, we need to prove that point too, right? Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, you know, there is, you know, people will often ask me, you know, how can we, um, you know, eliminate false speech? Um, how can we, you know, when people say lies about, um, you know, COVID or what have you, how can, you know, is that protected and, um, and what can we do about it? And, and the question, the answer is that yes, um, you know, false statements, except in narrow circumstances of advertising for products, false statements um, are protected speech, um, just like true statements. Uh, and the reason is, you know, one of the other themes of the book is, um, you know, if um, we were going to just start policing truth, who decides? I don't think that. Um, you know, liberals would have wanted uh, the last four years to have truth decided by the Trump administration, and and perhaps conservatives um, would feel the same about the the new Biden administration. Um, the the who decides you know uh, problem is is fundamental to why we have um, sort of an open uh, and robust debate as the free speech goal. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very tough issue, and uh, you know the Supreme Court said in what Gertz v. Robert Welch that there's under the First Amendment. There's no such thing as a false idea, except when it comes to things like libel or very narrow circumstances. And if you take the Alvarez case, 
involving lying about your military background. Right. Yeah, I think was it up to a year in prison for that? I forget the exact penalty. Yeah, it was, it was, it was penalty. I don't remember the amount. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, you're you're at a bar trying to impress somebody and you lie about your military background. A, that's not a good thing to do. I think you're a total schmuck. All right. It's 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 a violation of military of res due respect to the military and all that. But you're going to send someone to prison for, for or even exaggerating their military background. You can't do that. So then the question is, when may the law be actionable? And the, that's the court said in that case, if you are using a military background falsely in order to gain some sort of benefit, you know, that could be a, a case of fraud. So there are natural limits to speech. But then what do you do in an age of social media, which I'm sure we'll get questions about later, yeah. where everybody has an opinion and not everybody knows perfectly everything they're talking about. And I would apply that even to an expert, right? I mean, that's part of the, the uh, tension here. Uh, but hopefully experts know more about what they're talking about than those who are not experts. That's why we at least, you know, we listen to them. But what do you do then when there's a, such a cacophony of discourse. And in the Cohen case, the Supreme Court said a cacophony of discourse is a great thing. And I agree. I'm all nearly subtitle of my book is the need for intellectual diversity, right? Because issues are tough. But what do you do when that cacophony crosses a certain line? And how do you deal with that? Well, I, I think that's the question really for um, for today about free speech, not not just today's talk, but for our, our current age. And um, I felt like there were almost no significant discussions of social media speech in um, general interest books. And so the last chapter of the fight for free speech talks about uh, the problems, the many problems uh, of speech online today. I begin with Sasha Baron Cohen attacking um, in a speech to the Anti-Defamation League, uh, what he calls the Silicon Six, the, the leaders um, of the um, social media companies. Um, and he criticized them, and particularly Zuckerberg, um, for um, allowing too much hate online. And I talk about Lindy West and, um, and others who have been um, subject to you know, viol you know, violent uh, language and threats on social media, in her case, the author for having the temerity of, of saying that you know women were discriminated in, in, in comedy, um, and Leslie Jones, the actress and comedian um, who you know faced racial um, barrage of tweets against her when she was starring in the Ghostbusters mm -hmm. remake. Uh, so I begin with with these problems of speech, and then I talk about uh, the Supreme Court's first and only significant uh, discussion of social media speech, which is the 2017 case. It shows how sort of late to the game the, the court often is. But in that case, uh, involved a, a North Carolina man who was a convicted sex offender. And there was a North Carolina law that prohibited uh, any sex offenders from using social media at all. Um, not just to, you know, in a narrow way, perhaps to not talk to, to, to children, but, but at all. Uh, he posted about a parking ticket that he had um, won um, in court, um, and then a, a very um, hardworking police officer um, tracked him down um, and, and arrested him for violating that law. The case goes to the Supreme Court, and, and Justice Kennedy, in one of his last significant opinions, says that um, we can't limit um, social media access to social media speech, even for um, maybe bad actors um, like the sex offender, because the modern um, use of social media is like the town crier of the past mm -hmm. on steroids or like, steroids, public, not steroids, not put. yeah, like being in a public park, um, and, and you know, where you need to be able to speak and right. be heard. So the court feels like, uh, social media speech is like other forms of speech. Um, and they are going to be incredibly, um, protective. Um, right. against any limitations on our, our right. rights to use social media. Right. However, I also explained, just to go another minute further, that social media companies as private companies, Twitter, Facebook, what have you, they do not have to abide by the First Amendment. Remember, right. as I know you know that Congress, the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law that's been applied um, to the federal government and through the 14th Amendment to state governments and other state actors. But social media companies can do right. what they will. They can restrict people, right. uh, even the president of the United States. Um, they can edit right. or flag content. They can refuse right. to make ads from some people and not others. Um, and, and those are, in fact, um, expressions of the social media companies' right, right. rights themselves. 
But this will lead into our next question about okay. that. Before, um, but you, you talk about uh, Kaepernick yes. and the NFL and his sort of normative free speech right. But the NFL is a private organization as well, correct? That's right. So, uh, right. How, so, how do you reconcile that tension? Yeah. So, um, you know, I begin with Kaepernick, which I think. And why, if he presents a free speech issue, why doesn't, uh, when Twitter doesn't allow all that true information in the end about the investigation against Hunter Biden right before an election, why is that okay, but not okay to censor Kaepernick? Well, I, I disagree with you that that information was necessarily true, but put it in there. Was aside, federal um, though, right? What was that? There is a federal investigation going on. I, I actually I don't know the details, but I but I um, and I don't know whether that's continuing. But but I, I I I think that there's not enough evidence actually to support that. And as you argue in your book, just because um, as there is a theory or a claim out there, doesn't mean that it it needs to be recognized as true. We don't right. teach uh, creationism in, in it, university because is it up them up to them then to prove it, even though it hasn't been disproven. Well, I want to answer your, I mean, I'm not going to try to avoid this, but I don't want us to, to delve into a, a debate about Hunter Biden, but... Um, oh, no, but we're talking about the, first, the free speech aspect of it. Right, well, so I, but I do I'm want to answer the other part of your question. Either. What was that? I'm not here to take a stand on that case either, because I don't know enough about it. Um, so so let's let's put that aside, and I'll that. answer your other question about, about okay. Kaepernick. So, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, Kaepernick's um, protest, uh, the Take a Knee protest, you know, I talk about in my book how... The fact the Supreme Court has never addressed whether you have a right to um, stand for the uh, uh, for the national anthem or that you have to have, but they have addressed um, Jehovah's Witness school children during World War II. Okay. Which you well, talk well, quite well in your book. Right. Thank you. That, that who wanted to um, protest, um, uh, who didn't want to be forced to pledge allegiance to the flag because they believed it was a form of idolatry. So I um, and it goes up to the Supreme Court and. And Justice Jackson, um, you know, finds that there is a right not to speak. In other words, that the government can't compel you to speak a message that you don't agree with. Um, right. So, so that protects who? Does that protect Colin Kaepernick? I mean, the 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 short answer is no, because as you point out, um, he is a private. The NFL is, is his employer, and employers um, and private companies don't have to abide by the First Amendment. But I also go on to say that that's not the end of the conversation on in any way. One, um, we are also talking about, I think, free speech values. And, and after the, the the death of George Floyd, um, I think it's interesting how quickly the NFL was really willing to turn on a dime about um, you know what they believed were the NFL values toward speech. But also, the Barnett um, school children protect um, other students um, who are engaged in that same type of Kaepernick take a knee protest right. uh, if they are a part of a public school or public university system. So student athletes who choose to take a knee, if their administration punishes them in some way or tries to prevent them um, from taking right. uh, that, that knee, right. um, the Barnett case that I described actually firmly protects them. Um, because then there is state action involved. So, um, so that's the that's the comparison between uh, the NFL and, and social media. Yeah. But I would just, from my perspective, um, we, we maybe can talk briefly, I and mean, we move on to audience questions uh, about cancel culture. And I noticed, you know, a Amazon now, which is a major forum. You know, we're not just we're not just talking about a small company suppressing someone's speech. We're talking about the main forum that people use now. Uh, to express their positions and to talk about things, uh, that they've taken the documentary about Clarence Thomas, which was the number one seller of their documentaries, off. You can't even get access to it through Amazon. And um, other action, you know, Twitter's done that with various political figures. Uh, isn't that a threat to free speech, too? Uh, you know, you I, and I never hear that. The, the public forum is now largely private. And that is something new in our constitutional history. So how do well, we, how do we solve it? I mean, you, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the public forum, um, you know, I mean, newspapers were always owned by by the wealthy and powerful. So even, you know. Um, they were a small part of the overall market compared to these guys now. Well, but I would say in some ways we have a, a greater diversity of options. It used to be, you know, way back in the day, you only had newspapers. And then you only had newspapers and radio. And now. So that so, would be the way to deal with it. I agree. If we yeah. can get a proliferation of more 
media, large media forums. Right. That's but, probably the best way to deal with that problem. I agree. Well, I, I believe that is one way. Um, and I, you know, one of the things I really try and do in the book is I'm not only comparing these cases of the past to contemporary questions because I want to answer those questions, although I do, I'm also showing that I think we can often draw on these 10 cases and the Supreme Court um, rulings and free speech fights of the past to answer lots of different right, contemporary right. questions. And I want people to sort of engage in right. that kind of process. But to, you know, just to engage for a minute before we have to move to another topic about about cancel culture, um, you and I disagree about how um, much of an issue this is. Um, I see um, when people respond to speech that they find hateful uh, and disagreeable and, and not something that re reflects their values, I just see that as another form of the marketplace of ideas. So again, we were saying freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom from consequences. Right. If Gina Carano wants to compare um, the way that she says Republicans are treated to Kristallnacht, uh, she has a, a free speech right to say that, yeah. but Disney is a private employer um, and they don't have to um, hire her back to be in The Mandalorian. And we, uh, as you know, people in the marketplace, um, we don't have to patronize her films. And in fact, um, if we call for her not to be in films, um, I, I think that is that is part of the robust marketplace of ideas. You can't, I, I think it's um, a problem to tell people that on the one hand, people have a right to say these things and you can't stop them. Oh, and also you can't be critical of um, of, of that position. Because I mean, that, there's, no, there's no question, and I've seen this problem a long, it's been around a long time that people say, my right to free speech means my right not to be criticized. Right. And of course that's antithetical. To any notion of free speech. The problem is whether or not, again, we, we cross a line where what you say can get you fired, or you can get mobbed by social media, or the company or the group you work for will be mobbed and don't have the sustenance to stand up to that mob. We are seeing more of that, I think, and that's something we're going to have to try to learn how to deal with. Absolutely, and particularly the sort of hate mobs. <laughs> Yeah, the, the viral hate mobs on, on social media are an absolute problem. And I am certainly not going to say that, that right. we should um, throw up our hands and give up on reforming the significant problems, particularly transparency about, about their policies um, with social media. I just don't think that um, I say in the book that I don't think that the Supreme Court will be responsive to that. And I don't think that the First Amendment is the tool to do that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't lobby right. or advocate for change in other ways. Well, maybe your next book will be antitrust and social media. <laughs> Not my area, but it, it sounds intriguing. Okay, should we move to audience questions? Yeah, that would be fun. I guess if we're at that, are we at that point, Katie? Yeah, I, I have to say I was feeling a real suppression of my free speech because I had so many things to say about what you were saying. So I was I was censored here in the uh, in the background. Now, we're only really partially canceling you. <laughs> Well, Downs, you know my feeling on uh, empty phrases like cancel culture and political correctness. We'll we'll, we'll talk about that another time. Uh, so we Mayer, have got Bill Mayer show. Eighty percent of Americans think it's a problem right now. Yeah, I, but I, I think Ian does raise a good point about um, the marketplace of ideas metaphor. Um, as problematic as it as it may be um, in some regards, uh, that's what we're seeing in play right now. Uh, so you know, I have a question. Um, and it relates to what Ian was saying about, you know, free speech doesn't come without consequences. And 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 Downs, you rightly note that that's antithetical. Uh, that very idea is antithetical mm -hmm. to to our traditions. I guess my my question is, um, in this era of um, like massive corporate power when it comes to expression, whether that's you know big networks like ABC um, or uh, big social media giants like Facebook. Um, does the First Amendment matter as much as it once did? Uh, should we be more concerned about other suppressors besides government than we are about government censors? You want to go first, again? So sure. Yeah. You know, I, I you know, um, Professor Culver, you know, that that point has been raised also by uh, people like Tim Wu at, at, at Columbia Law. Um, you know, is the First Amendment obsolete? He asked in a in a much talked about paper, uh, and I I I think the opposite. Uh, I think that uh, if the Trump administration has shown us anything, um, it's that we do have to worry uh, about um, 
about um, authoritarian control from the top. I, I think for a long time we we thought, oh, you know, the, the chance that we'd be censored or, or the, the chance that the, the state would move in to um, to uh, restrict uh, the press, um, those are those are decisions from the past. Those were incidents in the past, and it's not going to happen any uh, anymore. I, I think the, the you know the authoritarian regime. Uh, uh, that was uh, promulgated under the Trump administration really shows us that we do need um, to worry about our individual civil liberties um, and our particularly our free speech and free press rights. And, and one of the ways that I try and um, expound on that um, is to, I think that too often people now see um, the free speech and free press um, sort of uh, as protecting corporations, as you say. But in my book, um, other than one time um, where the New York Times is a, is a co-defendant um, along with civil rights defendants, um, I'm really talking about individuals, um, you know, anarchists in, um, in 1920s New York, um, a, a school children, um, both the, the Barnett uh, sisters um, and um, uh, Mary Beth Tinker, who was a student during the Vietnam era, uh, an elementary student who wore a black armband uh, to protest the war on both sides or to honor the dead on both sides and to protest the war. Um, and, uh, you know, Colin Kaepernick um, or even um, people like uh, the late um, uh, Larry Flint. Um, these are individuals. He also had a media company, of course, but, um, but these are individuals um, who are fighting for their free speech rights. And, and I, I think that we should not um, give up on our current protections um, because we think there's other greater threats looming out there. I, I believe that I'm certainly concerned about authoritarian speech and Trump's rhetoric was very problematic, okay, to say the least. Uh, <clears throat> nothing came of it. If anything, it generated more counter speech than anything else. Uh, but the rhetoric was certainly bad. Uh, but then, you know, given the prominence of these social, of these private institutions uh, and how they've become sort of de facto public forums in a very important way, I think we do have a real problem here, uh, especially now that we see, and I would disagree with Ian on this issue, I think there is much more of a process of creeping cancel culture in a variety of ways. And when they can simply say, we're not gonna provide this book anymore, even though we are in a de facto kind of public forum situation, I think that's a problem. That we have to wrestle with. So I would just simply go further than Ian in terms of this issue. But I would be the last one in the world to say that the government censorship isn't a problem. And you know, I you look at universities uh, and the authorities in many universities in the country. My book is largely about higher education and universities. Uh, the reason I decided to write my new book was what happened in Middlebury when Charles Murray was physically assaulted, <laughs> and along with the the, the uh, women who was the uh, moderator in that particular issue. So those are issues too. And I, I guess all I'm saying, maybe we need to broaden our concern about free speech because of this historically unprecedented situation of these private forums becoming de facto public forums. Well, we have, I, I could ask tons and tons and tons of questions, but we have lots of great stuff hopping um, in the uh, chat from our audience. So let me let me turn to those. Um, uh, there, there are many questions on this, but I'm gonna go with Linda's. Um, should we be thinking about limitations on free speech in an age of disinformation? Uh, what is our obligation and our responsibility to the truth? And I'll, I'll, I'll footnote or I'll add on to that and say, if the marketplace isn't handling it. Yeah, let me say something very brief, then take it over to Ian, uh, maybe come back to me then. But uh, truth really matters here, right? I mean, that's one of the main reasons in my chapter seven, when I talk about why it all matters, pursuit of truth. What is the UW, University of Wisconsin-Madison's official motto? That's where the UW system as a whole, you know, the stifting and winning new ideas by which alone truth may be known. I have the plaque right here to show people. I have all these little First Amendment knickknacks <laughs> upside down. <laughs> I have mine in my office. Oh, that was not a Freudian slip. Not going to my office anymore. And, I have uh, the same one. You've got to keep an eye on the truth. And I think in order for free speech to prevail, we have to teach not just free speech principles, but how to pursue truth, which includes do doubt about our ability to attain it, because none of us has perfect truth but a commitment to finding that truth. And that requires more rigorous thinking. And are we abandoning that in education as well? 
So there's uh, a tension there. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with all that. And I would just respond um, to the to the question to say that, um, you know, that the difficulties in pursuing truth are also, you know, eat multifold. Um, uh, those difficulties are, are increased multifold if we're trying to control the truth. Um, and one of the stories I tell in my book is how um, I begin with with Nazis marching in, in Charlottesville, one of the most disturbing things to uh, ever happen in my lifetime in terms of speech protests. Um, and I, I answered that, um, what can we do about hate speech? That question by telling the story uh, of Timothy Snyder, um, who um, was a man <laughs> trying to bury his son who was uh, died in Iraq right. by the Westboro Baptist Church, a, a hate-filled church uh, that protested outside of military funerals. And, and some of the things they said, <laughs> I will be willing to say here, are that God loves dead soldiers because they believed it was God's punishment. Um, you know, for um, America's um, being too tolerant toward uh, gay and, and lesbian rights. Um, so that case goes up to the Supreme Court and and Justice uh, Chief Justice um, Roberts says that we can't um, uh, restrict speech just because we disagree with the message and just because we hate the message, that these were protests that happened outside um, of, uh, didn't directly interfere with the funeral, they were outside on public land, um, and so he upholds basically the, the protections for, for hate speech, but but the twist comes, and this is where these real stories are, are so unbelievable but true, um, is that the two people, initially the father who sued um, for, um, sued the church and tried to get emotional damages um, for their hateful acts, um, which were over, that decision was overturned by the Supreme Court. Initially, he was devastated, understandably, but over time, very recently, he has said that he believes that his son um, died in part um, for the right of the church to say their hateful message. And in turn, another member of the church, um, who was sort of their social media director, was convinced by people on Twitter to re-examine her beliefs and ultimately left the church because of what they told her on Twitter. Two people who really had the marketplace of ideas change their beliefs. And, yeah. and two people that we would never expect them right. uh, to find a different truth over the uh, course of this case. But so two quick points about Westboro. And Ian's book deals with the case very well. Um, one is that the court was also careful to point out what was not being done in that case. This was, they, did, they did not go up to the family face to face. That's right. And and say that I'm glad you're, you know, well, your son's dying is because of America's immorality. Uh, it was more general rhetoric rather than face to face. And there is a limit for fighting words that are that severely provocative. There's a limit to, to threats. You know, we, there's standard First Amendment limits we haven't been able to get into because our time is constrained. But those would have, those would have applied had the facts been different in that particular case. Second point is that uh, Westboro Church uh, they come to Madison. They used to come to Madison all the time. Yeah. And uh, I once helped um, organize a counter demonstration to the Westboro Church uh, in front of the union. Uh, a student of mine wanted to censor it and disrupt it. And I said, no, don't disrupt it. Do counter speech. Disruption is, is detrimental to free speech. There's a big difference between the two because then you're denying their right to speak. You're denying the right of listeners to hear it. And a lot of listeners who wanted to hear them wanted to hear them because they didn't like them. They wanted to know more about them and then challenge them with counter speech, not disruption. So there's a sort of a UW history that's interesting. for a church as well. Yeah, that's it's interesting. You guys are so brilliant. You answered a question from the audience that I hadn't even gotten to ask yet. And that was, you know, can, is hate speech definable and, and are there limitations on it? And Don's right. There are limitations when uh, it rises to the level of true threats. Um, or fighting words, arguably one of the most ill-defined uh, phrases. And in, very in fighting words, but still, yeah. the court yeah. hasn't away with it. But I want to turn to um, the question of campus, and we're getting tons of questions yeah, <laughs> on uh, campus speech. So, yeah. so you know, I, and I'll I'll go back and forth between the the mm -hmm. uh, two of you. But you know, Amy asks, um, what is the state of free speech on campus? Yeah. Um, what message would you give to? Perspective yeah. students about that. Um, Bucko asks, from a historical perspective, are things is speech more under attack on campus today than it was in the past? Uh, Deborah wants to know, Ian, um, what the Supreme Court decisions in your book, how they relate uh, to campus speech, and 
then Doug uh, asks about the uh, ever controversial UW Regents policy um, mm -hmm. about disrupting free expression. So we've got all of those. I'll start off with Ian um, and ask you um, to, to deal with the Supreme Court decisions um, portion of the question. And then Don, maybe uh, you could give us a status update. Right, well, so our, our book, books approach this issue in two different ways. I really um, talk about uh, student speech um, and less uh, and less campus speech. So uh, that's that's uh, Professor Downs's book. But when I talk about student speech, um, not only um, with the Barnett school children who I talked about in the right not to speak, but I alluded to briefly um, Mary T Beth Tinker's um, fight for the right um, to um, protest in school. So she wore this black armband um, to honor the dead on both sides at the relative beginning of the Vietnam War. Um, and when the war was still uh, relatively popular in, in this country and um, her brother and another student wore these black armbands and they're all suspended. Uh, and the case um, championed by the ACLU and the Iowa uh, Civil Liberties Union uh, goes to the Supreme Court and Justice Fortas in some beautiful language that I'll paraphrase a little bit, says that students don't give up their right, uh, their first amendment free speech rights as they pass through the schoolhouse gates. Um, and, and that is you know, a, a lovely phrase that reflects the fact um, that students do have, for the first time the, the court recognized that students have almost the same um, free speech rights um, as adults, um, even in, in the school, um, even in the classroom. And, and the test is basically that there can't be a, a reasonable forecast of excuse me, substantial disruption. Um, so it can't just be some undifferentiated fear that something might happen, which is basically what they said at the school um, at that time. And Justice Marshall, I talk about um, in the oral argument, really sort of uh, trounces uh, the lawyer for the school district when he just said you were just worried that there was no there was no basis for it. So you need some you need some real basis that there will be a substantial disruption, um, and, and that um, is uh, sort of fundamental to the speech rights I talk about um, in my book. Well, let me say, and Don, let me, can I can I can I pivot that to the the um, regents policy for those who are joining us who don't know well, about the policy? Well, there's important points though that I have to okay, make. Okay, go for it. First. Go for it. Sorry. But I mean, That's one, right. one is about the relationship of truth to speech. The campus context speaks directly to that. In chapter three of my book, I make the distinction between academic freedom and free speech, because academic freedom is more of a professional concept which is bounded by such things as you know germaneness in the classroom. We don't let people teach kooky subjects, uh, especially in, in the harder subjects. We don't allow, you know, we don't teach astrology in the astronomy department. We don't teach that two and two is five in the math department. The pursuit of truth and, res and due respect for the experts in the class are essential to what the university is, right? If we just allow any idea to fly out there without being challenged and without, if we allow teachers, professors to profess who are totally unqualified, then we're not even, a, we're not a university anymore. So the, the ability to pursue the truth in the best way are, is the key criterion for getting a post in a university. That said, we need to be duly tolerant of all germane viewpoints regarding the subject matter, uh, because, you know, even the greatest expert can be wrong. But so there's a, the tension between truth and just freedom to say what you want to say. Also, you know, we grade students, right? <laughs> if a student's exam doesn't demonstrate knowledge, then that student gets a lower grade. But we don't grade people in the public forum out there on the street corner. We have our opinions, but we don't give them. Here's your official state grades, and we're not China yet. Okay, we don't do that. Kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing is the status of free speech. I think my book was a little bit too hopeful. I think things are pretty on campus. Things are. It's a lot of conformity of thought. Students, you know, Fire has all these surveys. Students are really concerned about it. Afraid to speak with intellectual honesty, which is a aspect of freedom that I think is very important. Uh, if, you say, if you say something different from what you mean, in a sense, you're committing intellectual fraud. But you, know, you shave it in order to not get attacked. So I think the status of free speech on campus is certainly a problem that people of goodwill 
are struggling with. And most of the surveys show that most people on campus, even now, don't want it to be this way. But they're afraid to sort of speak out and stand up. And so my book is really meant partly to uh, provide some instruction or helpful advice, hopefully, on how to resist the suppression of speech on campus. Uh, and th hopefully there is a critical mass out there that, that wants to support you if you do. But yeah, so, it was a confusing so, uh, it was for me. I'm gonna invent and then invoke a moderator's power <laughs> to, to uh, speak to prospective students. And that is to say, I, I am quite optimistic about the speech climate on campus. Um, you know, we've had in my 20 years here um, on the faculty, one incident of disrupting a speaker. And before that, it had been nine, 10 years uh, when I was a graduate student. Um, you know, my students generally report comfort with expressing um, even dissenting opinions sometimes. Um, and um, Don, you did a lot of work getting rid of student speech codes and faculty speech codes, and, and that work has, has mattered up to this day. Um, I want to uh, turn to a question that's coming up um, um, in the comments from the audience, and um, I'm going to pose it to you, Ian. It relates to a um, current lawsuit um, uh, that has been filed against UW-Madison um, relating to um, the muting or blocking of comments on social media. Not, uh, not blocking accounts, um, but using some muting tools. Um, so I, um, oops, sorry, something just happened there in the feed. Oh. Um, so I know as an attorney, you can never comment on an active case and we, and you know, neither you nor I nor Don knows all the facts of that case specifically. Um, but in general, when we're talking about um, governmental institutions like the University of Wisconsin, what are the new challenges that social media are introducing um, when it comes to uh, limiting expression? Right. Well, uh, yes, I've, I've heard of that case, but but don't know the details, um, which, would, uh, which would, I need to know. But but I, in the last chapter of my book, I, I do um, talk about social media, as we've discussed a little bit, and and talk about also, you know, what are the obligations of um, of people who control social media? I'm not talking about the university as much as I am um, about about private companies. Um, but I, I do believe um, that the good part of social media um, not being obligated to follow the First Amendment um, is because they're a private company, that the good part of that is they are therefore free um, to try and do something uh, about restricting hate um, and about labeling falsehoods. Uh, we wouldn't want the government to do that. Um, but um, but I'm fully supportive of, of, of Twitter and other platforms um, that were labeling um, lies about um, about election fraud that didn't exist, or about the lack of validity of, of the election, or about false statements about um, COVID and you know taking um, potentially dangerous um, drugs as a as a fake cure. I'm perfectly comfortable, and and the, um, and I believe that the court is. Um, perfectly comfortable with social media companies taking those types of actions because they are not government actors. This is the opposite, of course, of the European model. Angela Merkel um, criticized Twitter's actions on deplatforming the president, uh, the former President Trump, um, and saying that the government should be able to do that, not private companies. Um, they really have the inverse of our system. So um, it, it's not all bad, is the point I would make about um, how we can protect um, truth um, is that partially when private companies um, are freed from having to um, be you know, perfectly neutral the way the government is, um, that they can actually advocate for and enact real change. I think this is going to be one of the really fascinating areas of litigation. You know, we've had um, we had a case in Wisconsin um, where uh, with uh, legislators, state legislators blocking accounts um, from those who were critiquing them, um, include President Trump um, blocking citizens from following him. So it's going to be a it's going to be a hot area of litigation. And uh, this suit will be among that. It'll be it'll be something people are watching. Um, I have requested and been given permission by the gods at WFAA to take us five minutes longer. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. There are so many more questions that we could address, but I want to close on this one um, from um, Rav, which is, 
do you think that the benefits of free speech can be reaped if people who speak do not feel responsible for what they say? Um, how can we impose or generate that sense of responsibility? And you know, this gets to that 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 what you were talking about earlier on, Ian, which is the idea of um, you know, free speech doesn't come without consequences. It, it's feeling right now a little bit like it, it does, and so uh, do we. How do we? How do we balance that that essential tension between rights that we enjoy as citizens, as individuals, um, versus our responsibilities to each other? Well, for me, I, I think the responsibilities um, to each other are, are, are vital to our, our speech notion. We can't have a good uh, or productive dialogue. Um, about speech unless we are trying to be open and respectful to people. That doesn't mean that people will do that, but but that is certainly the better goal. Um, and I, I think that our responsibility um, is twofold. Um, one, it's what Professor Downs said before about responding to um, bad speech with, with more speech, with, with corrective speech, with speech that challenges um, the falsehoods or, um, or the hate. Um, and the second way we can sort of be more responsible speakers is by knowing about um, our free speech rights. Um, I, I think so often people um, make statements about, um, you know, what they can and can't say, um, uh, because, but they're, they're speaking out of a lack of knowledge. And, you know, people will always, um, my bugaboo is that people will always say, well, you can't cry fire in a crowded theater. Um, but people forget that the two key components of Justice Holmes' statement uh, in that phrase were that you can't falsely cry fire in a crowded theater and cause a panic. So falsity and harm are really key. They're not enough necessarily, but they are the key things we should be thinking about when we're thinking about restricting speech. So, you know, I would just advocate that by learning more about our rights, we can be responsible actors and better put forward and protect truth. I should add that even the Supreme Court once left out the word falsely <laughs> in one of its comments about what Holmes said. So, so it's, it's, if even they get it wrong, right? So now everyone who's listening to this talk can go forth and, and, and get that phrase right. right. <laughs> none, none of us are allowed in voted <laughs> theaters right now, Ian. Not a one of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of now, what do you make of this tension? It, it, I think it, it speaks to an aspect of our culture that is sort of prior to First Amendment citizenship. And that is, you know, being brought up to have due respect and to learn. I have a whole, like several pages on the issue of civility, which I define quite differently from how most people define it now. It's not just politeness. It's having um, respect for people's ability to have ideas and challenging the ideas and rather than challenging them as persons. So you're a horrible person to think that. Here's why you're wrong. Now there are limits, certain ideas, you're gonna think the person's horrible. But nowadays we tend to think someone's horrible if they just, just disagree with us. And we have all sorts of conversation stoppers that come into discussions. How can you think that? And that freezes discussion. So we need to train, we need to enculture um, the ability to withstand vibrant discourse at the same time that we teach people due respect for others, as well as the uh, the fact that people will strongly disagree with one another. And a lot of that has to be done by institutions outside of higher education or even the schools. Yeah. Uh, one of the maxims at the end of my book that I, I put forth is, is um, it is that it's vital to protect dissent. And that's just um, echoing what Professor Downs just said, that, that protecting of dissent is, is crucial, again, a, a, another way in which we can um, make sure that we're engaging responsibly in, in promoting truth, I think. And I think we need to look at dissent within in terms of institutions and local areas, not just sort of nationwide. Yes. Because yeah. what's an orthodoxy over here may not be the orthodoxy over there. Definitely. Well, I, I, a number of our commenters have uh, raised questions and suggestions about civics education, about, yeah. you know, 
raising young people to understand and respect free speech. Um, I just can't say enough about Ian's book and how accessible it is. Um, I've assigned it to my college students, but it'd be fine for it'd be fine for my younger kids as well uh, to read. Uh, it really tells the story of the people um, behind uh, the fight for free speech and. One of the difficult things, as I say to my students all the time, is that First Amendment history is littered with horrible people, the kind of people that you don't want to defend. Um, and, and yet, and yet um, we, we have stepped up and defended them. So thank you, Mackenzie, for the extended time. I feel like we could go a whole another five hours, but I appreciate the fun. <laughs> yes. And Mackenzie, I, I'm gonna just steal two more minutes for one. Yeah. Uh, it's a surprise, I, I didn't tell anyone about it, but uh, a little tribute uh, to Downs. Um, when I, indulge me for a second here, when I was going to law school, um, I was very nervous, I was a theater major, I wasn't sure it was the right thing. I go into a Cornell Law School on my first day in the building and I go to the pre-internet era really, and so I go to the mailing room to pick up um, my mail, and in there um, is this letter. Um, from Professor Downs um, on my birthday. Um, he had been researching his book, Cornell 69, about the protest movements um, and, and fallout at, at Cornell in that year. Um, and I just wanna read the last paragraph. Um, now for your work, uh, just be what you are and you will become what you can be. Sounds like I am uh, an army recruiter. Oh well, I'm momentarily choked up. My hopes for you are high, both professionally and normatively. Keep the faith, the intellectual faith, down. Um, I have been able to um, fight um, for the intellectual faith because uh, of people like um, Downs and, and, and at the University um, of Wisconsin that exposed me to uh, an amazing teachers like him. Um, and uh, it really, you know, this letter meant so much to me um, at that time, and, and your mentorship um, means so much to me today. So thank you for engaging in this debate. Well, thank you. Like, like I said earlier, it's a two-way street. You know, you get, get that feedback, that, that then you, you know, you draw on that. That that nourishes you as a teacher. So it's a two-way street. And I miss well, it. I miss it. Well, we're, we're so pleased to have had all of you with us today. Um, nourishing is a, a good way to, to phrase it with this discussion that we had. And on, the, on behalf of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, thank you so much, Ian, Don, and Katie, for the wonderful discussion today. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us as well. We hope you enjoyed your time with us. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing your own copy of the Fight for Free Speech or Free Speech and Liberal Education, please see the links in the chat for more information. Again, I'd like to thank our program partner, the Wisconsin Union. I know that today's program was made possible thanks to the generosity of the Sandra G. Sponham Alumni Park Signature Program Series Fund. Finally, we hope you'll be able to join us on Thursday, March 18th, when we present the Wisconsin Idea Spotlight, Answers to an Ancient City, with UW professor Nicholas Cahill, as he discusses the history of the ancient city of Sardis in Turkey and explores new facets of the ancient world. If you'd like to learn more about our programs or if you'd like to watch recordings of our previous programs, please visit the website for more information. Again, we can't thank you enough. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Be well and on Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. Bye-bye.